Hello everybody, I'm Katherine Korostoff and welcome to a conversation here for Research Rockstars. And today I'd like to talk about how we can write survey research reports that are really going to have a great impact on our clients. So when we write those reports where we're really doing a great job of delivering and synthesizing results from survey research, how can we do that in a way that's going to have the most impact? So Let's first of all step back and talk about what some of the challenges are when we are writing quantitative research reports. If you think for a minute, what is the hardest part of writing a survey research report? Well, what I hear from a lot of our students at Research Rockstar is that sometimes it can be a bit overwhelming. You've just collected a lot of data and sometimes it can be hard to figure out how to prioritize that data and how to put it into a logical flow that's going to make the report writing process efficient and also make sure that it has the most impact for the readers, the ultimate clients for the research report. And it's understandable. Even if you're writing reports based on fairly short questionnaires, uh, maybe it was a questionnaire where the average respondent was taking your survey for just five or six minutes, it can actually still generate a fair number of variables. And then if you're doing a lot of cross tabs, a lot of different types of data analysis, it really can create a lot of data. And then for those of you who are doing larger surveys, if you've got questionnaires where you are collecting data for 40 or 50 questions, that can easily swell up to 100 or more variables. It can be a lot of data to have to synthesize and report. But we know that the way we report is important because the report that we deliver from a survey research project, well, that's often the most tangible deliverable from doing survey research. So even though throughout the project you've done a brilliant job on questionnaire design, managing the data collection process, and so forth, the report that the client gets is what tends to have the lasting impact. If you go to talk to that client three months after the project is done, they tend not to remember so much about what happened in terms of planning and executing the project. What they really remember is that final report and the final presentation. That's what sticks with them. But the challenge is, that, is frankly that the survey research process can be pretty complex. There are a lot of different steps to doing survey research. So you typically start off a survey research project with a kickoff meeting. And after the kickoff meeting, you have some deliverables you might be creating. Maybe you're putting together a schedule or some sort of project management plan. Maybe you're documenting your sampling plan or your data analysis plan. After you've got the documentation, then you're going to start on your questionnaire design, which is often an iterative process. It's very typical to go to three or even five iterations of a questionnaire before we're ready to get client approval and actually start programming that survey for either online or telephone data collection. But we're still not done, right? So all of those steps took a fair amount of time and effort, but now you have to go into pretesting, data collection, doing your analysis, creating charts and graphs, and only then are you really ready to start writing to really start figuring out how am I going to create a deliverable here that is going to really thrill my client and maximize the chance that they're going to put that research to use. So there's a problem here though. Because there are so many steps to survey research, we typically get squeezed in terms of our schedule. Inevitably, we end up doing more survey iterations than we expected, or data collection takes longer than expected, or perhaps the client has changed their mind about the scope of the project at some point requiring some tweaking along the way. By the time we get ready to sit down and write our report, we may very well be squeezed on schedule. So our client is expecting the report by a certain date, and we may find that we don't have quite as many days to create that report as possible, it can really be a very stressful part of the job. So what do we do? Well, in some cases, we can reset client expectations. We can say, hey, you know, as you know, data collection went longer than expected, or as you know, we ended up expanding the a variety of types of data analysis we conducted, so we're going to need a little bit more time before we can deliver the report. And sometimes you can get a few extra days, but sometimes you can't. Sometimes the client has a hard deadline. They might need that report for a board meeting or a big annual sales strategy meeting or to inform a product, a product roadmap process that has a hard date. So sometimes the client doesn't have a lot of flexibility. So if we find that our schedule went off 
course during the planning process or questionnaire design or data collection, what tends to get squeezed is the last part of our process, writing the report. So if we're getting squeezed on writing the report, we have to make sure that we're really repair, prepared so that we can write that report as efficiently as possible. Now, at the highest level, survey research reports usually follow a fairly typical outline. They all have a title page of some sort that includes the title of the project, the whoever is creating that research report, whether it's a research firm, an individual, the date of the report, and so forth. Now, typically, after the title page, we have an executive summary, which is often two to seven pages, although there are exceptions. And indeed, what I'm seeing anecdotally these days is an increasing interest in one-page executive summaries. I don't want to say it's a big trend, but anecdotally, I am seeing more cases where the client is saying, I want that executive summary to be one page. Whether it's one page or seven pages, the important thing about an executive summary is that it needs to stand alone. Sure, if the reader is interested, they should be able to go to the full report, the body of the report, for more supporting data and for more thorough interpretation and analysis and presentation of proof points. But the busy client needs to be able to read that executive summary and get what they really need. It needs to have the power of standing alone. So typically after the title page, we have the executive summary. And typically after the executive summary, we have the scope and methodology section, which is where we talk about when the data was collected, what our sampling frame was, what were our quotas and screeners, what was our data collection mode, uh, that, was, that is, was it by phone, was it mall intercepts, was it online, et cetera. Now, there is something here that can change. In some cases, professional researchers prefer to put the scope and methodology first, and in some cases, the researcher prefers to put the executive summary first. Usually, the decision about which one to have first is based on your audience. If you're dealing with an audience that is a little bit of sort of a market research skeptic, that is people who are likely to be a little bit skeptical or cynical about the research results, with those types of audiences, it's usually best to open with your scope and methodology because that's really where you get to establish the credibility of your research results. Hey, look, we talked to the right people. Uh, we talked, we enforced qualifications so that we were really sure about it. Hey, this data is fresh. Hey, we collected this data in a way that was best for the population of interest. So the scope and methodology is really your chance to sort of have your preemptive strikes, if you will, for those readers who might try to discredit the research or who might challenge the research results. This can be the case if you are delivering research that is likely to ruffle feathers, as it were. For example, if you're delivering research results from a customer satisfaction study and maybe the results aren't as positive as the client is expecting, in cases like that where you're kind of delivering bad news, it can be a good idea to open with the scope and methodology because it does create that establishment of, look, this is professional research, it was done in a very thoughtful, thorough, objective way, and here's all the proof of that. Now I'm going to deliver the results to you, some of which might be contrary to what you expect. So again, some researchers will put the executive summary first, some will put the scope and methodology first. Personally, for me, I usually will put the executive summary first um, because I feel like with my clients that I've worked with a lot of clients who are executives and they just want to immediately go get what they need and get out and they don't necessarily want to get too into the weeds. But again, it's going to vary by your audience. Now, after you get your title, your executive summary, and your scope and methodology set, typically then there's a big chunk of the report that is what we call core content. And this is what we have to really think about when we are planning that research report. So again, if we're likely to be under the gun in terms of schedule, we want to re write a great report, but we want that report writing process to be efficient, it's really important to think about how to structure the core content of your report. That's something that we have to plan on, and it turns out that there are three common ways of doing this that I'm about to talk, th talk through. But after the core content, then you're typically going to have a final section on demographics, which will have any demographics that 
are being used for your cross tabs or other multivariate analysis or just to profile the population a bit more. And then also survey research reports typically have appendices. For example, you may include the actual questionnaire. Um, by the way, I know that not all researchers do this. I often will include the questionnaire. The client might not read it, but I've had many clients who really like to have the questionnaire so they can see the flow of the questions and that can help them understand the research results as well. Also, perhaps you want to put some select banner tables into an appendix. And if you had some open-ended questions, you may have an appendix that summarizes the results from the open-ended questions. So at the highest level, your quantitative research report typically has those parts. So let's dive into a little bit of that core content because the core content is usually the most pages or slides, if you prefer, in your research report. So how you structure that is really important. Now, there are some researchers who will simply have a section they call detailed findings, and they'll put all of the charts basically in one section. Now, if it was a really short survey, very short questionnaire instrument, maybe that's okay. But if it's going to be more than 20 slides, I really encourage you to figure out a logical way to break it up so that your reader will get the most value. If you're basically putting 20 or 50 slides in one section, you're not breaking it up in a way that's giving them any visual cues to understand what they're really digesting. Making your report modular does make it easier for your reader to follow along. So let's talk about this in terms of assuming that we do need to have some sort of structure for the core content and we're not just putting all of the slides in one giant section called key findings. If we are going to divide up the core content into modules, then we have to really think about structure. And typically the structure is going to follow one of three patterns. The most common is to structure the core content by project objective. Most survey research projects have two to four project objectives. And in this case, you would simply have a subsection with a subsection slide for each project objective. So that's going to take that core content section that would either be, say, you know, a big blob of 30 slides and turn it into three or four subsections. Another way to do it is by geography. If you're working on a project where there are important, there's important analysis by geography, then having the core content broken out by geography can be very helpful for your client. For example, I've done a lot of multinational studies where we have one section that's the universal results, so sort of like our results for all of the geographies as one summary, but then maybe we have one section on, on Eastern Europe, one on Western Europe, one on Latin America, one on North America, etc. Just be cautious about the phrase North America. Some people confuse this. North America is actually the United States, Mexico, and Canada. And a lot of times people refer to North America and they don't use the term correctly. So just, just a point of caution there. But I've also done studies that are US only, but geographic breakdown is important. For example, years ago, I worked with a client who had regional vice presidents. So there was a Northwest vice president, a Northeast vice president, et cetera. I, I think it was four or five different US regions. And so what I would do is I would organize their report so that they got the total US results. And then there was a section on each geography so that those regional vice presidents could get the data that was most pertinent to them but they could also see what was going on at a higher level. And that was really helpful to them because it allowed them to just not have to get distracted, right? You know, business executives are busy folks and we want to make it easy for them to find the data in the report that's most relevant to them. So there's often a, an opportunity to organize a report by geography. But the third way of organizing a report is, in my experience, a bit underused, and that is to organize your report by functional application. This is going to be very relevant for those of you who do high visibility projects. If you're doing customer satisfaction work or customer loyalty work, or you're doing market segmentation work, for example, or other high visibility projects. If you're doing these really strategic high visibility projects, you're probably delivering results that are going to be used by multiple functional areas within the organization. And some functional area executives are going to be more interested in some of the data than other pieces of data. 
So why not organize that course section so that people can find the data that's most relevant to them? For example, maybe you've just done a big market segmentation study um, for a big consumer goods company. And sure, there are some universal results. We can talk about overall customer, you know, the, the, the overall results that everybody, you know, should know about at the aggregate level. But maybe there are some results that are really laser beam oriented more towards the sales department. You know, maybe there's some stuff here that the sales executives really need to know about. And what about manufacturing? Maybe there's some results that have implications for manufacturing. Well, why not just have sections of the report that highlight those key results? So if I'm the sales executive, I can perhaps read the executive summary, but also then see, oh, there's a section that's really for me that has those results that are most pertinent to sales. And then the manufacturing vice president, she can take a look and say, hey, I'm going to focus on these results. Because in an ideal world, would we love everybody to read the whole report? Of course, but that's not always very realistic. Maybe there are sections of the data that are really only related to marketing. Great, then let's have a section that's just a modular section with those slides that really relate to implications for marketing. And maybe there's a section for customer support, right? Just for the customer support or even in a more granular way for a call center, for the person who's running the call center division. So organizations have functional executives, right? There are different people responsible for different parts of the organization. If you're dealing with a project that you're trying to write in a way that's going to be very efficient, but also have the highest impact, consider breaking out the report by functional application so that your reader can easily find the data that's going to be most relevant to them. So again, there are multiple ways of organizing reports, but if you're finding that there's a lot of stress because the time allotted for writing a report is never enough or you're getting squeezed because data collection went longer than expected. Having a really precise plan and an outline is going to help a lot so that when you do come out of data collection, you know, so when you are getting to the point where it's the end of the project, you know, you've finally got out of data collection, you're doing the analysis, you've got a really great outline that's extremely precise. The more precise your outline, the faster you're going to be able to write that report. And frankly, the better the outline, the chances are the better your report is going to be for your clients. So again, those are the three ways for organizing the structure of the core part of your survey research report by project objective, by geography, or by functional area application. I hope that that conversation was useful. Um, I hope people give that a try. If you haven't written a report where you organized your course sections by functional area application, you might want to give it a try. It might be worth an experiment. You may very well find that it actually makes report writing faster and more efficient, and you may very well find, as I have found on many occasions, that it really thrills the client as well. Other news coming up, I just want to share with you that I'm very excited. In January of 2018, we have a new class. This is a one-time only class being taught by special guest instructor Jeffrey Henning. Jeffrey is the CEO of ResearchScape, and you may have also seen him speak at various trade shows, uh, both in the U.S. and abroad. He's teaching a two-day class on customer experience titled CX, Net Promoter Score, NPS, and Beyond. And you can find that on the Research Rockstar Training Store at training.researchrockstar.com. If you have any questions or comment, please do leave them here. I'll also upload a document link here so that you can see an example of a couple of the slides that I use to talk about defining the different ways of uh, organizing research reports. So I'll put that in the comment section. If you are watching this on YouTube or listening to it on iTunes, please do give us a review and subscribe. Uh, the more subscribers and views I see, the longer I'll keep these series of conversations going. Also. Here's my contact information if you want to send me any other messages. Thanks, everybody, and have a great day.